Hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. I'm Embry, and this is Be Queer Make Stuff. I am a trans non-binary sewist, and I am putting this out here as part of the COZY 2022 program. COZY is the Costube Symposium, and it is a cool collection of people who make videos and programs and panels all in the same weekend to share for the world. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you stick around and enjoy some other people's videos too. Today we are gonna look at a Regency era silk waistcoat that I just made. So this project is a black snails pattern and I've actually used quite a lot of black snails patterns. I really like the way that their patterns come out. So I went ahead and I started with just the basic largest size that I thought would fit me. I knew for this project I would need to make a mock-up because my proportions are not your standard guy's proportions. And this is a men's, quote-unquote men's, waistcoat, so it was time to uh, make some adjustments. I've had um, top surgery, which means I am very, very flat on top, but I am not very, very manly in the hips. So I knew there were going to have to be some give and take made, and indeed there was quite a few things I had to change. Alright, I have made a very quick and dirty fit test mock-up. It ain't pretty, I know, but it does the job of what I need it to do, which is to test the fit. So there's quite a few things on this pattern that are designed for just like your bog standard quote-unquote man shape. Um, and that is kind of like a, just a brick shape, you know? <laughs> you got your shoulders and you got your waist, and they should be, according to like the world of what is man, um, should be roughly the same size, up top and up bottom. That is not the case for me. I have uh, considerably narrower shoulders than I do waist. <laughs> it's not a bad thing and I don't actually mind it, but I am sort of pear-shaped. Um, pear and hobbity. I'm hobbit-shaped. So the changes I made were I actually removed like kind of a substantial amount from the chest area and the shoulders, but that's okay because I ended up having to put in about the same amount, ironically, um, at the waist to make that fit. So I just put a little, I put a little wedge in here so it would be comfortable with the full belly. The other thing I did on the back is, it's kind of hard to see because I did it on the inside, but I, I did kind of like a dart here to take out about an inch from the upper back just because it was bubbling. Um, again, my upper back and shoulders are just narrower and there wasn't room. And then at the very bottom, where there's like a little split for a little, a little nice little tail effect, um, I also added a little wedge in here. My hips are a little bit fuller, and I wanted to give this room to sort of glide over my hips and not get bunched up. Now my job is to take these changes and make these changes on the paper pattern. All right, it doesn't quite all fit in frame here, which is too bad because you can see how much I have to transfer to the paper pattern here. But, um, this is the pattern piece as I pulled it out of the mock-up, and this is the paper pattern. And I have to reconcile these so that they match. I have made all of my pattern adjustments here. There were four different spots I worked on, and I am now ready, in theory, to cut out my silk. I got this from Vogue Fabrics down in Chicago, and I got a really good price on it. I paid just under seven dollars a yard, and I got all that was left on this particular bolt, was, which was one and three eighths yards, which should be plenty for what I need for the waistcoat. The thing I have not decided yet though, is what I want the lining to be. Okay, I just went through my whole fabric stash and I found this, which is like a almost perfect color match for the stripe in here. And I think it just looks really nice. It is also probably silk. So it's not actually what the pattern calls for for a lining, but, but I'm gonna do it anyway. 
it'll just be even more fancy. Um, I am gonna actually do a burn test though. So this is the fabric for the waistcoat. This is the lining I've potentially chosen. And these are two other fabrics that I got from Vogue that are like, these are probably poly. I think this is silk and I'm pretty sure this is silk, but we're gonna find out. All right, per my handy dandy reference book here, if the material is silk, it will burn. It will have like a clear edge to its burn and it will crumble a little bit. If it is poly, it will unsurprisingly kind of melt a little bit. So we're just going to be looking for if it melts essentially, because I don't have a particularly nuanced eye for like the variances between these, but we're basically looking for is it poly or not. First up, this is the waistcoat presumed silk. It burns. It's definitely coming off in chunks and it doesn't have like a hard edge like melted plastic. So I'm going to go ahead and say, yeah, that was silk. Yay. This is the, I'm hoping it's silk. What I've chosen for the waistcoat lining. I don't know for sure that it is, but based on the price I paid, it's probably silk. It was deep discount, but it was not a cheap, cheap, cheap discount. All right, this is a very similar feel. It's not like a super hard melted ridge and there are chunks here. So I'm gonna say, yes, this is also silk. Yay. All right, so this I think is a poly silk. By poly silk, I mean it's poly pretending to be silk. It's very nice, but I'm pretty sure it's plastic. But let's find out. Yeah, that, although honestly, now I'm not sure. I am not 100% sure on that one. It honestly doesn't have what I was expecting from Polly. So I don't know. That was not what I expected. Huh, let's go to this one, which I also am pretty sure is Polly. So maybe it'll be different enough that we can use it as a comparison. All right. This is more what I expected from a poly situation in the sense that it's um, a little bit more like melty on the frayed edges here, but it's still not exactly what I expected. Huh? So these are our four samples and I am, I, I, I am unconvinced on two of them. <laughs> I'm pretty sure about these two. I'm unconvinced on these two. So what I'm going to do is put them in a bleach solution. So I'll do that and then we'll check back up on them after that. All right, all the usual smart things people tell you applies here. Do this in a well-ventilated area. I have a nice open window with a fan. Don't poison yourself with bleach. All right, it has been a little over an hour and I would say results are in and results are conclusive. Here is the what's left of the silk for the body of the waistcoat. And that is definitely silk. It disintegrated the heck out of itself. Here's what's left of the silk I'm going to be using for the lining. It also just completely disintegrated there, which also means it's silk or well, it means it's a natural fiber, but in this case we can reasonably assume that the natural fiber is silk. Then we have this, which I was not sure was silk, but I honestly did think it was poly, but it has disintegrated to a large extent, which means so far three out of our four are actually silk. Last but actually least, 
there's this boy. So this is the guy that I thought was for sure Polly, and I was pretty sure on the burn test that it was Polly, but it's nice to get the confirmation. This did not disintegrate at all. This is a full swatch still. There is no hint of disintegration, which means it is some sort of synthetic fiber, probably Polly. But the bleach test was very conclusive. After picking out what fabrics I was going to use, it was just uh, a matter of making the garment. And I say that as if that's not like actually quite difficult. <laughs> oh, it's just, I don't know. Silk is fun. I'm not used to playing with silk. I've only done one silk project before this and it's just like, it makes such a cool sound. It's a very unique sound. I will confess that I got myself confused several times while making this, like several times. Um, my poor partner can confirm that I several times walked downstairs and was just like, what have I done? What have I done? Um, <laughs> it all worked out fine, but there were some hiccups. Um, I had to like basically go cross-eyed reminding myself to do it wrong sides together because you sandwich it in that historical technique and that was really difficult for me to get my head around. I kept wanting to do it right sides together so and then flip um, which is like the more modern technique but this one is much more frequently in the pattern. It is wrong sides together, one slightly larger than the other, turned inwards and then you prick sew it so it is, you, there's no flipping. Um, and I got myself I got myself very confused, especially when it came to like the lining, what is the right and the wrong side of the lining, considering one of them is facing your body, but that's the right side, not the wrong side. <laughs> um, I had to redo a couple of things a couple of different times, and it was a little bit embarrassing. Of course it was at this point that I realized I had in fact ironed the iron-on interfacing to the wrong side of the lining, so I had to completely scrap that. I did actually spend like a painful 15 minutes trying to see if I could get it off um, and I determined that uh, no, no, I could not get it off. So after getting the lining kind of put together at least a little bit and getting the collar on, the next step was to put on the welt pocket. So there's two welt pockets in this pattern, one on each side of the front and Welt pockets are terrifying. I did end up doing like a tiny little baby welt pocket practice because um, I was uh, scared out of my mind to do a welt pocket on my nice pretty silk because welt pockets are scary. <laughs> Thank you. 
gosh, they look so good. Just look at this. It looks so yummy. It looks so yummy. With most of the like intense pieces done, the next part is just like so much felling and so much prick stitching and then so much more felling. The pattern calls for all of this to be done by hand. I actually did some on machine. Anytime it called for a back stitch, basically, I just ran it through the machine. Um, there's only a couple places it calls for that, and I just decided it was fine. I'm already using fusible interfacing. This is more historically inspired than historically accurate, so I didn't feel too guilty about it. But a lot of the body is done by prick stitching, and then the inside is flat filled. So with my half done waistcoat, I headed over to the local makerspace. Uh, a makerspace, if you're not aware, is basically a collective, a community of people who all pay a membership and then share tools. That way you don't have to buy, you know, a, a very, very specific tool you're only going to use like four times. Um, and the great thing about this makerspace is in addition to having a great wood shop and a great metal shop, they also have some sewing stuff and they have a pretty nice single needle embroidery machine. And although I have done my fair share of hand done buttonholes in the past, I really wanted to try something completely new and that was gonna be using an embroidery machine to do buttonholes. So I went on the internet, I found a, a, a seller on Etsy who made a pretty cool like set of like, I think historically inspired, I don't know if they're entirely accurate, um, but historically inspired at the very least buttonholes I bought the little package of them, I downloaded it to a thumb drive, and I stuck it in the embroidery machine. And lo and behold, buttonhole tests were done. But I will say, even though I had tested the buttonholes and confirmed that everything worked fine, I was pretty nervous to hit the yes go button on the machine with my nice silk in there, but it did go, and it worked out just fine. And honestly, I'm pretty delighted by this whole process. It is pretty neat to be able to just go in there and, and have a machine do your buttonholes and have them actually turn out really nice. I've had a lot of difficulty before with like basic domestic sewing machines making decent buttonholes. Um, and these are pretty ritzy. They are fairly stiff. There's a lot of thread in them. And obviously I interfaced the ever loving life out of this before I did anything with the embroidery machine because I was I think reasonably worried about it fraying, um, but I think they turned out really quite special and I am delighted by them. Speaking of delighted by and quite special, a lovely little person on the internet sent me these amazing thread covered buttons. Uh, this person lives across the pond and was able to color match like perfectly just from a photo and I am just like verklempt. Um, I really, really like the buttons and all of your dear heart. But yeah, don't they look so great? I think they look so great. It was just like a joy to sew them on right next to the fancy buttonholes and know that like the whole thing was gonna look super luxe. The last thing to do was hem it and I don't think I got any footage of that because it was boring. Um, I did put a slightly more angled um, edge to it than the pattern actually has. I thought that a slightly more triangular base would look a little bit more flattering on me. But with the hem done, it was complete. So I got to do the fun thing, which is go play dress up. <laughs> so I took myself uh, the trousers that I made with the bicycle trousers, and I made my rectangular shirt as well, my linen shirt and I put on my waistcoat and I went to the UW Arboretum. There wasn't a ton flowering just because of the time of the year, but I definitely enjoyed what there was to see. And I hope you enjoy seeing the result of this waistcoat. So there are some things here that I am really, really proud of. One was determining that I could do the machine embroidery buttonholes and that they would turn out quite so nice. 
And I'm also proud of the way that I adjusted the fit to make it work for my body. I am much more of an avocado-shaped human than a brick-shaped human, and I am pleased that I was able to get it to work. It's never a given that it's gonna work out the way you want, and it worked pretty well here. I'm wondering when I did the mock-up if I was actually too recently done with surgery, if I was still swollen. It is um, got a little bit extra space where I don't need it anymore. <laughs> Because it's got that pinstripe, it's not a good fit for like a quick little dart to fix the issue. So I think I just need to accept it. It's not the end of the world. It's a little bit weird fitting up here, but overall it fits. And I like that I have enough room for the belly. It doesn't feel constrictive. And I think it looks quite fun and I like it. So a quick wrap up here because the waistcoat may be done, but there are more things to tell you, like cost. Something that I really uh, feel strongly about is um, transparency within the maker community, whether it's sewists or anyone else, about how much things cost, because it can be really hard to know if that really cool cosplay you saw cost $40 or $400. This project was actually fairly cheap, and I'm pretty glad about that. I got all of the fabric on discount, which was nice. The striped fashion fabric was um, discounted upholstery silk from Vogue Fabrics, and the lining was also from Vogue Fabrics. It was a remnant, so it was, um, I think I, I think it ended up being like a yard and three eighths or something. So I have more of it left, but that was quite cheap because it was a remnant. Now honestly, it was cheap enough that I wasn't positive it was silk, hence all of the previous testing. <laughs> The only other components to this was thread, and I just used thread I already had, and the buttons, which were graciously provided by Ollie. Um, oh, and the pattern, of course. So honestly, a pretty cheap little project. And that's it. That's a wrap. Um, now I just have a little tiny pocket. I don't really know what to do with it. I've been kind of keeping my, um, been keeping like thimbles in it. <laughs> I don't know. It's cute. It's not symmetrical. But it's a little tiny pocket, and now I have it. Um, yeah. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I like making videos, I like hanging out with all you guys on the internet, and I hope that you stick around and hang out with me in the future. If you want to spend more time with some cool genderqueer and trans and just cool allies, I have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash stuff, and signing up gets you access to the Discord, and also any behind the scenes posts or polls or weird little tidbits I have to share. Sometimes that can be a bit sporadic, but I do my best. It's reasonably affordable. The lowest tier is $3 and that gets you access to the Discord. So if you want to come hang out, please join. Until next time, be queer and make stuff. Bye bye.